Well, good morning and uh, a warm welcome to Gateway Church Merseyside's online service. We've had people joining us from Cape Town, South Africa. We've had people joining us from other parts and uh, also the Merseyside region. So uh, just really trust this morning God's going to minister to us and speak to us. Uh, and right from the outset, I'd love to have the scriptural prayer over us. It's a beautiful prayer from 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way and that you continually enjoy good health just as your soul is prospering. Don't you love that? Just as your soul is prospering, just as your mind is prospering, just as your will is prospering, just as your emotions are prospering. You see, God's interested in all of you. God's interested in, in our our hearts, God's interested in every part of us, mind, body, soul, spirit. He created us in his likeness. And uh, so he knows that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are complex. And some of you may feel a little bit of isolationism, if there's such a word, where you've just felt, uh, yeah, when is this going to end? And will what's the new norm? Are we going to go back to being uh, a people keeping to ourselves. I pray not. You see, God never intended. It's through the church the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to principalities and powers. That's the collective. That's the call out ones. There's no solitary saints or spiritual hermits. We called and heal in community. And, and so I'm trusting that we're going to be able to uh, be united I see even the Queen's been on, uh, I don't know, it was Zoom or whether it was a, a video conferencing with other carers. And so we've had to adapt and uh, I'm proud of her in her 90s to be able to get onto a, a media platform and chat to other people. But that, I pray, is not the new norm. And this scripture was shared in the positioning for the prophetic for us as a church. And I think it's beautiful. It's from the Passion Translation, Psalm 103, the first four verses. With my whole heart, with my whole life, and with my innermost being, I bow and wonder and love before you, the Holy God, Yahweh. You are my sole celebration. How could I forget the miracles of kindness you've done for me? You kissed my heart with forgiveness in spite of all I've done. You've healed me inside and out from every disease, and you've rescued me from hell and saved my life. You've crowned me with love and mercy. That's our God. That's our God. Great God, great King, great Savior. He could take our minuses and make them into pluses. He could take our brokenness and bring healing. And we're going to be looking at that this morning. Jesus, our great physician. And even the songs build into that theme. And uh, the times we find ourselves, the days of Elijah, distress and <clears throat> hardship and even famine in some parts of the world and pestilences. And we see plagues of locusts and we see COVID around the world. We're living in, in these times and, and then be thou my vision. I think that's a powerful, powerful hymn for the times that we find ourselves. You see, whatever we focus on will become transformed by and if we look to the Son, if we look to the Savior, we'll become more and more like Him. And then one final verse from uh, Psalm 40, verse 5, also from the Passion Translation. O Lord, our God, no one can compare with you. Such wonderful works and miracles are all found with you. And you think of us all the time with your countless expressions of love, far exceeding our expectation. You see, God's able to do exceedingly abundantly and measurably more than we could even ask or possibly imagine. That's our God, a more God. And I trust even this morning that God's going to do great things in us and through us. So let's trust as we go into these songs now for God to minister to us. God bless you. Amen. Solid. 
days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses' righteousness being restored And though these are days of great trial Of famine and darkness and sword Still we are the voice in the desert Crying, prepare you the way of the Lord Behold He comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun And the trumpet call Lift your voice It's here of Jubilee And out of Zion's hill Salvation comes Days of Ezekiel, the dry bones become in his flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as wide as the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard. Declaring the word of the Lord Behold He comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun At the trumpet call Lift your voice Fear of Jubilee And out of Zion's hill Salvation comes There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes riding on the clouds. Shining like the sun As a trumpet call Lift your voice To hear our jubilee When out of Zion's hill Salvation comes Behold He comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun As a trumpet call Lift your voice It's here of jubilee And out of Zion's hill Salvation Saved, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place. At the sound of your great name The enemy, he has to leave At the sound of your great name Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us Son of God and Sound of your 
verses 1 to 15. Jesus heals a lame man. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda, with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, You can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But, he replied, The man who healed me told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, Now you are well, so stop sinning, or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Good morning, Gateway Church. My name is Pippa, and it's great to be speaking to you this morning. Whether you're part of the Gateway family already, or whether you're just joining us online whilst the country's in lockdown, welcome to the service, and we hope you've met with God so far. This morning we're going to be looking at John chapter 5. I'll be following on from Steph last week where she spoke about Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman and hopefully I'll pull out a few points from the passage that maybe you haven't noticed before or maybe you haven't thought about before and then how does that relate to us? The Bible says that the word is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword so if we're reading the Bible it's alive and how and what does that mean to us in 2020 in lockdown in a church setting in Liverpool in the UK um, how does this word come to life for us so hopefully I might give you some ideas of how it can be applicable to us today I'm just going to start off um, by praying if you want to join me Father God thank you for your word God thank you that we can come around your word 
no matter what our background or our experience, God, and that you can breathe life into our bones, God. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would meet with us, that you would strengthen us. Lord, your word says where two or three are gathered, you're in our midst. And God, I pray that your grace would cover us in this lockdown and that you would be in our midst, Lord, where we're gathered around our TVs and our phones and our computers. God, would you make your presence known? Would you speak to us? Would you encourage us, Lord? Would you be with us in Jesus' name? Amen. So far in the book of John, Jesus has been travelling up and down the country. There's the wedding in Cana in Galilee in the north, and then he comes back down for the Passover in Jerusalem, which is in the south, and then he heads back up through Samaria and talks to the woman at the well, and then he's back up performing miracles in Galilee, and chapter 5, he comes back down to Jerusalem, and this is where he meets people at the gate. So, first of all, what is the gate? Basically, Jerusalem is a walled city and there's key entrance points that are locked down at night, the city is fortified and protected, and then they're open in the day for the trades and the visitors um, and just the general traffic influx of people. Outside one of the gates on the northeast side of the city, there's this pool called Bethesda, which we come across in chapter five. I've read this previously and thought, you know, sort of jacuzzi size, the water's stirred and the first person to jump in gets healed. But actually, archaeologists have found the pools are sort of 50 to 60 metres long um, and it's a big space. And around it are these porches where invalids, the sick and the dying, are all lying, waiting to jump into that water when the water is stirred. Um, why would they be outside the city? In Jewish culture, generally, if you're ill, unwell or dying, you are unclean, you are not holy, you can't go to the temple, you can't socialise. If you go through Levitical law, there's lots of things that you're prohibited from doing. And so I imagine that the sick people fled to this pool in the hope that God would touch them whilst they're being shunned from society. When I read that the scripture says that the water stirred, an angel of the Lord comes and stirs the water, I'll be honest, I actually thought, well, that sounds a bit dodgy, <laughs> um, but it's in the Bible. It's in my Bible. And if you think about this, in the Old Testament, the power or presence of the Lord only rested on one person at one time. Um, they were anointed, they were empowered, they were strengthened for a purpose or a season. Now we're in the New Testament and Jesus is here. He has that anointing and that authority but we've still not had the, the release of the Holy Spirit yet. So we still haven't had the presence of God everywhere. The presence of God is still only in a place at a time for a season. So it does make sense that these waters are stirred and people are desperate to get into the presence of God in these waters and they know that they'll be healed. So my first point that I want to pull out is that Jesus seeks out the sick. Why was he there at the gate? These people would have been lying around for years. The guy that Jesus is about to encounter has been there for 38 years. If you're shunned from society, I can only imagine how unwashed you are, how smelly you are. I won't talk about the toilet, but there's not toilets there. And so why, but why was Jesus there? He seeks out the sick. We'll put a map on the screen now, and you can see that he's coming down from Galilee in the north, and he comes down to Jerusalem, I'm going to presume, to this gate at the north of the city. And this is where Jesus has compassion, where he seeks out the sick. So let's look at the scripture. He sees this man lying there and he knew that he'd already been there a long time. I just want to encourage you that Jesus knows everything. He knows where you've been, he knows where you are, he knows what you're doing, he knows everything. And he asked the guy a really interesting question. Do you want to be healed? And I found this question really odd because if you're shunned from the city and if you're waiting by the water for the presence of God to heal you, surely the answer is yes. Or surely it's a daft question. But it's interesting, the guy's response. And um, I'm going to pick on my husband a little bit here, because when I ask Ash a question, 
I'm introverted in my thinking, and I'll just say the answer. My beloved husband is extroverted in his thinking, and he'll give me the whole meandering explanation of how he gets to his answer. <laughs> and I've learnt in the five years we've been married to just laugh and wait patiently. And I find this guy's answer isn't straightforward, and it isn't, yes, I do want to be healed, and I know that he doesn't know who is this guy asking me, why is he here, why is he at the gate with all the sick people, but his answer is, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. And this is where Jesus is seeking out his heart what's what's going on on the inside and just inviting him into the conversation to start sharing where he's at which leads me on to point number two which is Jesus knows his heart and although he doesn't say yes I want to get healed and he doesn't say just a simple yes it sounds like he's lost his hope and it sounds like at times, he could be wallowing in self-pity. There's no one here. I'm on my own. Someone beats me to it. I don't have the strength to move. And, and it's hard to imagine being so ill and so lonely for so long. But Jesus understands. I'm not saying that his attitude is wrong. I'm not saying that his attitude is sinful. I'm not saying that he should be like, yeah, let's get to the pool. Because if you've been waiting so long and in the course of the months that turn into years, that turn into decades and everybody's left you and you watch other people get down there before you, it's understandable that hopelessness can creep in. But I want to say that there is hope for that problem. Which leads me on to our third point, which is Jesus' words are powerful. They can cut through every situation, every circumstance, every excuse, every lie, and he can bring life. And he simply says to the guy, get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. There was no dramatic... Uh, spectacle. There was no, mm, sounds like your attitude sucks. Maybe you should consider this before I heal you. God sees his desperation and he sees his helplessness and he steps straight in to bring life. And then the guy, the guy that's been healed, goes to the temple. And this is where really there's a, there's going to be a bit of a clash here of religion. So Jesus healed him on a Sabbath which is against the law. And the guy carries his bed, which is against the law. And so the man, once he's healed, he goes to the temple. But why is he doing that? If you're not really allowed to do anything on the Sabbath, why is he um, having all this commotion and everything going on? If you go back to Levitical law again, when you're healed, there's quite a lot of protocol that you have to follow to then be classed as clean, to be acceptable to God, you know, the guy would have had to go through a guilt offering, a wave offering, a sin offering, a burnt offering, and a grain offering, just so that he could be allowed back into society, back into the presence of God, and to be whole again. And the priest to say, yes, you're now clean, you can come back into society. And it's interesting that this winds up the Pharisees, because you're not allowed to do it on, on the Sabbath in that culture. And so I want to just say that Jesus hasn't come to give us a list of religious laws and behaviour to keep up. He's come to give us life. And it doesn't matter what day, what time of day, how long we've been lying there, how long we've needed help, how long we've lost hope. He's come that we can have life. So how does this all apply to us? Going back to the first point, Jesus seeks out the sick. We're called to be like Jesus. We're called to seek out the sick. And I want to share a short story and, and then a way that you can seek out the sick 
Um, so one story that has really stuck with me for a long time actually was when I was finishing university in my third year I went on a missions trip to the Ukraine with my church at the time and we went round orphanages and old folks homes um, praying, entertaining the kids, singing to the old people, praying for healing um, and just sort of following whatever the Holy Spirit was doing and at the time in the Ukraine once you got to a certain point in the poor countryside we were in, old people were just sort of thrown in a building together. You couldn't really call it a care home because there was no care. and They are just left until they die. But there was an old lady that really struck my heart. And I just felt like God said, you need to go and sit with her. And she hadn't joined in with anything. She hadn't spoken. She hadn't give any, given anybody any eye contact. Um, she just kept herself head down, gaze fixed. I want nothing to do with you. And initially I thought, well, she's a grump um, in my <laughs> young naivety. And so the Lord said, go and sit with her. So I just went and sat next to her and held her hand. And after five minutes or so, I just started crying, just tears rolling down my face. And it was the Holy Spirit just showing me how lonely and hopeless and broken she was and after a while she started crying too and by the time she started crying um, we got a translator over because I don't know any Russian and she didn't know any English um, and she just said that I was the first person to have touched her in about 10 years and to just sit with her and know that she's loved and I didn't know what I was doing I didn't know the situation, I didn't know her circumstance, I still don't know any Russian, and, and God can use that. So how do we seek out the sick whilst we're in lockdown? Well, I would like to invite you to pray for our friend, Sean. He is um, the brother of one of my husband's friends in property, and he had a trampolining accident in lockdown. And he was trying to do some spectacular double somersault something, and tragically landed on his neck and was rushed to hospital, potentially paralysed. And as a church, we've come together to pray for Sean. And this is where we've stepped in to fight for him. And we're praying for him and he's been able to come off the ventilator at times. He's got sensation in his limbs. He's too weak to move them at the moment, but he's got a sensation where the doctors thought that will never come back. And um, so I want to invite you to join with us and pray for Sean that he would have full healing. It would be a complete miracle and a turnaround that he will be able to walk again, to play with his young kids, that nothing will stop him from living life to the full and that Jesus will heal him. So join us. Point number two, that Jesus knows our hearts and what's our heart attitude like, especially in lockdown where it's been a real roller coaster of emotions and one minute we feel like we're fine, the next we're just acutely aware of our isolation and then we maybe lose hope. When is this ever going to end? Um, but what's our heart attitude towards God, towards his presence, towards his healing? And is there anything in there that God doesn't want in there? Is there any self-pity? Is there anything that we need to repent of? And, and I can relate to this. I was really ill for a long time and when I got married my organs started to go crazy, my liver was attacking itself, my body just shut down and I really lost hope. And it's tough, it's tough when you're in a season where you've lost hope and we lost our closest friends and we lost our church family and nobody was there for us and praise God it wasn't 38 years but it was a good few years and it was a really hard road to walk on. But at the same time, I needed to be really careful of my heart attitude, and yes, I walked through a season of, I'm never gonna get better, we're always gonna be lonely, God isn't gonna heal me, like, I'm just gonna end my life. It was hard, but God brought us out of that and just miraculously gave us hope. We never thought we'd have Children, we thought I'd always be too ill, and as many of you know, we have a crazy giant, almost 10 month old now. And God has restored so much, but at the time, my our heart attitude was, I've given up on you, God. And if you've given up on God, I want to encourage you to start again. And if you're feeling hopeless, I want 
to encourage you to ask for help. Ask for people who are hope-filled and hopeful for you, that we can stand in your place whilst you're just on the floor and we can help pick you up and come around you and love you. you we don't want you to be like this paralyzed guy who's on his own for 38 years, just waiting for an encounter with God. Let us be the hands and feet of God and come and love you in this season. But is there something we need to repent of? And self-pity can look different for lots of people. And sometimes it, oh, well, my life's harder than yours, or it would be e life would be easier if I had a better job, or if I had more money, or if I wasn't married to them, or, you know, just where's our heart up to? And is there anything that we need to invite the Holy Spirit into and ask for forgiveness? And finally, Jesus' words are powerful and our words are powerful. If you look in Matthew 28, there's a scripture where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So that's God has given Jesus all authority, everything. Everything is subject to Jesus. Skip to Luke chapter 10. And Jesus says, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. And so Jesus has given us this authority and not some authority, not a bit for a certain thing. He has given us all the authority he has. He's given that to us. We have all authority. And Proverbs 18 verse 21 says death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit and so I want to encourage you that Jesus has given us all his authority over sickness over disease over the works of the enemy we have all authority and the power is right here and so what are we doing with our tongue? Are we speaking life? Are we speaking encouragement? Are we speaking challenge in love? Are we cheering people on? Are we fighting against the works of the enemy? Are we praying for Sean or one another? Or are we whinging and are we tearing people down? Are we slating our spouse? Are we scolding our children? Are we whinging about work? Are we gossiping? Are we, you get the idea. There is such power in our words and Jesus has given that to us and so I want to encourage you to wake up to how much authority you have and it's I'm speaking to myself here too I need to be careful of what I'm speaking how I'm speaking to my husband how I speak over my son but probably more importantly what I speak over myself because that's like the secret monologue of where you tear yourself down or you build yourself up so be encouraged Jesus sees you, he's seeking you out, he knows your heart, and he has given you power to overcome. Amen. Morning everyone. We're going to be taking communion again this morning. And uh, so if you haven't got the elements together, the, uh, the bread and something to drink, then uh, maybe you want to pause the, the, the clip now and actually go do that. But we will carry on. Acts 2 verse 42, straight after Pentecost. Um, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Then a couple of verses further on in verse, verse 46 and 47, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. It's interesting that in these passages, it talks about breaking of bread. And breaking of bread has become a term that we as Christians use for communion. But uh, here it, it, it was quite clever them, them utilizing this because breaking of bread in those days is also something that referred to taking meals together in a home. So breaking of bread was something that was being described as totally normal as taking a meal and do, having a meal with someone. But it was also seen as something so special because it was the one thing that we did to remember what Jesus, Jesus did for us. And I think we need to make sure that, that we remember both those things today. That the breaking of bread is something normal. Um, if we, we come to God and, in, in faith and accept Jesus' death on the cross on our behalf, we are saved. We, we are a new creation. And uh, as the one place in Scripture it says, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, His mercy is new every morning. It is something that we, we are, can start afresh every day. 
and it is something normal. When we take this, it is we are remembering something that has become normal for us. But we're still remembering what an astounding act it was that Jesus went to the cross and died for us, that his body was broken for us, that his blood was shed for us, so that we could have all our past sins forgiven, that we could actually accept his righteousness in, in our place and live a new life. And so today, as we, we do this, let's remember his, uh, what, what he actually did for us. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take each element and just pray for each as, as, as we go through and as you do this. So let's start off by just taking the bread and remembering that his body was broken for us. Father, we thank you that, that by your stripes we are healed. Thank you that uh, your body was broken so that we could actually live healed in body, soul, and spirit. Thank you that you did this for us. And we just take this bread now and remember that. Father, we thank you that you not only broke your body for us, but your blood was shed for us, and that your blood is what can cover our sins and cleanse us from all the things that we've done that are wrong, that, that we can actually live a new life. Yeah. 